Hi, everyone. Welcome back to my podcast. I'm here with Mark Schatzker. Welcome, Mark. It's really nice to have you on. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So I first heard about you, I think, through Rob Wolf, as many things in nutrition. Um, and I think it was uh, regarding the Dorito effect. And uh, was that your first, first book about nutrition? Well, I guess, strictly speaking, yes. I wrote a book prior to the Dorito effect about steak. And that was really just a travel book about traveling the world eating steak. But that, that's what you know, got me into the rabbit hole of nutrition. Why do we like meat? Even questions like, why do cows eat what they eat? And it turns out they have a kind of astonishing nutritional wisdom. They're not just sort of idiots out there in the field. They, they know what they're eating on some deep and intuitive level, so. Okay, and, and you're also, um, you're a writer in residence at the Modern Diet and Physiology Research Center at Yale University. So maybe you wanna tell us uh, about that. Yes, yeah, so that's, um, when I wrote The Dorito Effect, I wrote about the research of a scientist named Dana Small, um, who's at Yale, um, I wrote about some of her work with um, artificial sweeteners, um, that book was really concerned with flavor and understanding our food choices through the lens of flavor. Uh, and Dana reached out to me and um, invited me to, to partake. She thought that my approach to science was, was interesting and it surprised me, um, but it's been very fruitful. It's been very enjoyable to, to be immersed among scientists to take part in their weekly meetings. And I'm even participating in some research and generating some research questions, which, which has been, I mean, incredibly stimulating to, to be part of the scientific process. Um, you, you realize it's, it's, um, it's, it can be very thrilling. It can be frustrating and things can take an awfully long time, but it's, uh, um, there's something great about it. That's, that's awesome. That's the kind of, kind of multidisciplinary uh, approach that's, uh, that's sort of fruitful and productive and, and not just um, lip service, as is often the case in science when we talk about multidisciplinary stuff. No, you, it's true. And I think, you know, I, I sometimes wonder why would those people have any interest in talking to someone like me, but I think a generalist can add to the discussion because science has become so incredibly specialized that, that, that scientists are so immersed in their own silo just to keep up with the research in their very narrow field. And I don't mean narrow negatively, but, but it's just become incredibly specialized that it can often help to hear a perspective of somebody who's at a much greater distance and sees things from, you know, kind of the, the view from 30,000 feet. Yeah, and I think it actually helps uh, retain some common sense in the conversation because in, in reading, so I haven't read uh, the, your whole book, but I've read a couple of chapters and have looked up, uh, made some searches with keywords for subject I was interested in and read some chapters that you recommended. Um, and I, I was very interested in the whole discussion you had surrounding liking and wanting and going into the food reward hypothesis and these concepts like palatability. Uh, yes. And I think there's, there's a lot of what you brought, which was like exposing the, um, th there's a sense where these notions are nearly too simple and, and quite vague when we talk about these things. And you mentioned some experiments, which are really elegant, how th they help disentangle these concepts and show us that this, this uh, at least that's how I interpret it, that these simples idea around obesity just being a question of people lacking the rigor to restrain themselves and, and having too much tasty food available to them is it might be too simple to really explain what's going on. So that was a big, interesting part of the book. So if there's anything you want to say about that, please, please launch into it. Well, that, you know, that was particularly interesting to me. I, I mean, right on the surface, it's interesting, you know, um, I talk about behaviorism in the book and, and um, people might know behaviorism. It was, you know, one of the, the main branches of psychology in, in the 20th century. And they, behaviors didn't believe in pleasure. Um, they thought everything was, they, they believed in um, drive reduction theory that, that we were driven by almost like painful drives to quench our thirst, to, to take in nutrients, to, you know, to have sex. And that what we think of as pleasure is actually just making pain go away. And we kind of look at the behaviors as being almost crazy. Uh, there, there was a kind of rigorous logic behind it, but what I find is there's still kind of a ghost of behaviorism in so much of the science around eating that we, we relegate the idea of pleasure, sort of bursts of neurotransmitters. We use words like reward. Um, viscerally, it is so much bigger than that. It is such a, a vivid experience of the world. It's, it's how we bring the world inside us so that we can continue to flourish. Um, but what I found interesting, what you're talking about is the work of Kent Barrage, which was looking at the, uh, really at dopamine. Um, dopamine is a, 
major neurotransmitter. It's probably the one neurotransmitter most people have heard of. Like if they've, maybe serotonin might be up there too, but a lot of people have heard of dopamine. And for a long time, dopamine was seen as the pleasure neurotransmitter. It was like the magical fairy dust that caused yumminess, euphoria, glee. And Kent Barrage, uh, very early on in his career, strongly believed in this hypothesis. And he set out, as we do, you know, you don't test a hypothesis with one experiment, you come at it from many different directions. And he set out to, to test it. And he did so um, with rats. And what he did was he used drugs to reduce dopamine in the reward part of the brain. And he fired some sugar water into their mouth, thinking that, you know, with dopamine out of commission, there's not going to be any kind of a response. And what he found is that there was a response. And this really surprised him. And he concluded that he just must have goofed up. And he did it again. And it happened again. Um, so he, he kind of elevated the, the stakes, so to speak. He, he put a lesion in these rats' brains so that that dopamine system was just gone. And, and they were in this kind of beige, pleasureless world. They were almost catatonic. Uh, and yet it happened again. He put the sugar water in their mouth and they responded. They, they respond with things like, like sticking their tongues out or licking their paws. There were these little bursts of of glee and joy. And, and this seemed totally at odds with the idea that dopamine was pleasure. So then he kind of switched things around and he amplified this dopamine network using, um, you know, uh, electrical stimulation. And now the rats would gorge themselves. And superficially, this sounds like, okay, we're back into dopamine being pleasure. But he observed their, their facial reactions and they were making these, what, what they call a gape. It's kind of like a yuck reaction on the parts of the rats as though to say this food is awful and yet I can't stop eating it. Now there was other information coming from other areas of science. Dopamine is also involved in movement um, and Parkinson's disease um, is related to reduction in dopamine in other parts of the brain. So there are drugs that are given to uh, people with Parkinson's disease that elevate dopamine. And these patients would do bizarre things. They would go on gambling binges. They really love uh, slot machines or scratch cards. They would just sort of maybe take apart their fridge on a whim or start chopping wood, or they would pester their wives for sex. Um, they would binge watch pornography. But interestingly, they would say they felt compelled to do these things and yet never enjoyed doing it. So it, to observe them, you, you just assume they like what they're doing. They look motivated, but they said, no, they were not enjoying it. So Kent Barrage finally pieced the puzzle together and what he found that what we talk of as reward or pleasure in general is actually made up of two distinct but related neural systems. The first one does run on dopamine, but that is motivation. That is the desire, a visceral desire to do something. It's like a missile tracking system. Um, you see the object of reward, you track it, you are drawn towards it. Um, it's a very powerful system. It's very old. I mean, we find it in in creatures as old as slugs. It's been around for hundreds of millions of years. But that is not the complete pleasure equation in humans. There's another neural system that runs in the opioid uh, neurotransmitters. And that is what Kent Barrage calls liking. That is the pleasure impact moment of food. That's when you put the food in your mouth, you light up and you say, my God, that's delicious. So, so dopamine brings us towards it. There's that expectation of pleasure and then there's liking, which is the experience of pleasure. And they're not always the same thing because sometimes we are drawn to things and we find we do not like them. So these two um, networks talk to each other, they update each other. And I think it's important because, um, you know, I'm also very interested in culinary culture. I started as a travel writer. I love to eat, I love cookbooks, I love traveling, I love eating. And what's so interesting to me about the science that looks at food, we talk about things like intake and palatability, which are such, such kind of cold um, descriptors. And, and this, like I said, it is such a, a rich experience of food. What I found so interesting about this is it, 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 it brings the pleasure of eating into multidimensionality. And this idea that we just eat for pleasure, um, that we're just surrounded by too much tasty food, it's, it's to me, it's just simply too simple. And there's just too much contrary evidence all over the place. Yeah, that's a really nice in introduction to the to the topic, because if we think about it a little, we can actually think of examples in the real world where that comes through. I think people uh, don't like the taste of coffee initially. So there's yes. not, not that liking, but there's definitely a drive to consume it. And same with dark, bitter chocolate. It's what we call an acquired taste. 
which yes. is describing this transition a state between both both uh, let's say arms of this uh, of this experience of this phenomenology um, you see it also with uh, cannabis you can increase the liking of a food uh, probably the drive as well there's probably some dopamine action here but you don't see uh, the dysregulation that accompanies uh, the consumption of uh, junk food. So junk food makes you want to eat it compulsively, and you also fail to regulate your, your energy balance uh, after that. But with cannabis, we see it in acute setting where you can get an increase in consumption, yet you don't have the metabolic dysfunction that leads to obesity thereafter. Um, so there's these, these like natural experiments or bulimics who uh, are have a compulsion to eat, but yet feel terrible while while consuming it or over consuming it. So we can definitely think of examples where it, uh, where we can separate these things. And the yes, experiments and, are just very elegant. And even on just a broad cultural level, and I think this may be kind of a North American bias that there's always been a suspicion of pleasure in North America, the idea that our inclinations are kind of anarchic and need to be controlled. And I spent some time in Northern Italy, which is, um, you know, a culinary epicenter, not just of Europe, but of the world. Uh, Northern Italians eat an incredibly rich diet. Um, they, they have what would seem superficially to be an obsession with food. Um, the Chamber of Commerce in Bologna actually has an official repository of, of recipes. I mean, think of this is a Chamber of Commerce saying this is how you must make certain recipes. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, but it's real. They have a golden noodle, a tagliatella noodle, cast in gold. It's, it's like that um, pure kilogram they have outside of Paris, but this is for a piece of pasta. Um, and the rate of obesity in Northern Italy is less than 8% versus the United States is 42%. They eat an amazingly good diet, delicious diet. I mean, people travel to Northern Italy just, just to eat, you know, I, I'm gonna have what the guy next to me who's speaking Italian is eating because they know how to eat. So um, there certainly is a problem with junk food and there is some relationship with the reward system, but the idea, and I think where we get into trouble is this the idea that anything pleasurable is addictive. It, it's, it's just much more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. I, my, my father is from northern Italy, he's from Bergamo, and they have a lot of polenta, which you, you talk about yes. in, the, in the book, and the, the differences between the ones you would feed to the pigs and the ones you'd feed humans, and, and yeah, there's a, a, a lot to that, and that food culture is just, uh, it's, just it's something else. It's a very different experience than when you're traveling in, in the U.S., yeah, and funnily, we would think that, you know, with their the arguments they get into about um, recipes, when you see them cooking and they put these large gobs of butter in a pan that starts to melt, as North Americans would look on that as these people are unhinged and have no idea about nutrition, but clearly their way of eating is, is working much better. I mean, they, they're happier and they're thinner. Yeah, no, I agree. They're, they're, they're definitely doing, doing better in that regard. Um, I also wanted to talk about the nutritive mismatch, uh, which is really interesting because for several reasons. Uh, one, because it evokes, I think, the mismatch theory of evolution more generally, which, which is at least personally a, a, a guiding framework for me to understand food uh, in general, because the, the complexity of food is so much greater than the complexity of a pharmaceutical, for example. And you really do need a, a framework to, to sort of sniff test all of those the claims that are going to come up. And I don't think you can do it without evolution. Um, I, I think it's much too complex otherwise. So I really like the concept of mismatch and e even more so the nutritive mismatch, because as you explain, uh, using the examples uh, uh, of the experiments with pigs, and uh, I think they're goats as well, because you cite uh, Fred Provence's work uh, yes. quite, quite a lot, quite thoroughly. Um, so I would love for you to just give a, an introduction to that and how do you think that comes into the obesity epidemic? Sure. So yes, I'll talk, I'll start with, I mentioned Dana Small, so I'll start with some of her research. Um, it, it started with one experiment, which proved to be quite pivotal. And she was asking what she thought was a, a relatively simple but important question, which was to say, is, can we design drinks that deliver the same reward, but at fewer calories? Because we tend to think this is a good idea this is sort of in line with the idea that our brain just has this ravenous appetite for calories. So maybe we can kind of fool it in some way. Um, the question is, how do you do that? And this is what makes Dana Small an interesting scientist. She came up with a really ingenious method. She came up, she developed five drinks and she used the um, five distinct drinks. She used the artificial sweetener called sucralose so that they were all equally sweet. They all tasted as though they had about 75 calories worth of sugar. But then she put in a, a tasteless carbohydrate called maltodextrin. Uh, 
um, which has no taste, but it's converted to sugar in the stomach. Um, and she was able, therefore, to give each drink a separate calorie payload. So at the low end, there was a drink with no calories. It was tasted like it had 75 calories, but had none. And then it went to, I think it was 35, 75, uh, 120, uh, 148. So we had these five drinks, all taste equally sweet, all deliver a separate payload of calories. They all had a distinct flavor and color as well. She let her subjects drink these drinks over a period of time so that their brains would come to learn what the value is. There's you know, post-ingestive learning. The, the brain analyzes what arrives in the stomach and forms opinions. That's how we come to like foods that are initially unfamiliar to us. And she hypothesized that the drink that would generate the largest brain response would be the one with 148 calories because we like calories, we need calories, the brain's gonna you know, seize on that drink. And similar to the Kent Barrett experiment, the results were so surprising, she did it over again. The drink that generated the biggest brain response was the 75 calorie drink, which just didn't make sense. It wasn't the biggest, wasn't the smallest. Um, if we like calories, why do we only like some, but not more? She did it again, it happened again. Now she did something even more interesting. She put subjects in an indirect calorimeter. This measures the thermic effect of food. Um, and that is um, when we consume calories, we generate heat as we, as we begin to process those calories. So the more calories you consume, the greater the plume of heat, the greater the thermic effect of food. This is what's in the textbooks. So one day a subject comes in and has the 75 calorie drink and just right on cue, there's this nice little plume of heat. A few days later, the subject comes in and, and this was a moment that really, it, very memorable for Dana Small, there was no effect. There was no heat registered. There was no thermic effect. And this subject was drinking the 148 calorie drink. What in God's name was going on? And then it struck her, the number 75, because the drinks were all engineered to have 75 calories. And they all, sorry, th that drink had 75 calories, but it also tasted as though it had 75 calories. So the taste matched the delivered nutrition. So a bell went off because we think of taste um, as sort of this frivolous experience that's disconnected from nutrition. We think nutrition, this is about nutrients in the stomach, you know, filtering their way into the body and taste is just something primitive and doesn't know what it's doing. And here we see that taste is in fact very important. It is the first signal in a metabolic chain. It's giving the, the brain instructions as to this is what you're getting and this is how you should start to metabolize it. And when there's this mismatch, it's like the brain doesn't know what to do. And it, 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 I mean, similarly, if you threw a party and you're expecting 10 people to show up and 50 people show up, you probably throw your hands and go, oh my God, what do I do? It's something like that. Um, so I think this shows us how important the sense of taste is that this experience of food that we experience as pleasure and we experience as tastes and flavors is not frivolous. It's essential to how the brain and body process food. And there's good reason. I mean, we've already had evidence about this. If we look at our genome, which is our instruction manual, the thickest, thickest chapter is on our nutrient sensing system, which is the nose and mouth. This is the brain getting a read on what's coming in. The brain is an information maniac. It, it, it measures all the time. It also measures post-ingestively. So this leads to a bigger question, which is to say, uh, if we know this nutritive mismatch is taking place, and I believe this is a relatively recent phenomenon, because if we think of the basic tastes and flavors, historically in the evolutionary past, they were dependable. Um, you know, our, our, our ancestors may have had to fight to get fruit. Um, there may be danger involved with predators. Uh, there may be competition. But once that fruit was obtained, the information that we sensed from it was was dependable. It, 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 the sweeter that fruit was, the more calories there were. Well, now we've created a situation in which the sensed, uh, the sensed nutrition in food no longer matches the actual nutrition. And artificial sweeteners are just one technology. Uh, I talk about it because it, it illustrates so well in, in the lab, but, but the food environment is just replete with all sorts of technologies that alter the sensed experience of food. Another family of additives, which people have very little idea about, are called fat replacers. This is an enormous multi, multi-billion dollar industry. When we see things like diet or light on a bottle of salad dressing or mayonnaise um, or, or whipped cream, um, that's because they have fat replacers in them. And these are 
um, food additives that evoke the experience of fat in the mouth. Now, fat is interesting because we have a fat receptor um, like we have for sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and umami, but it doesn't seem to sense fat the way we sense those other things. We sense fat with the trigeminal nerve with our touch receptors. So we found these compounds that can evoke this feeling of fattiness, that rich mouthfeel, and yet deliver fewer calories. This would be a good idea, I think, if our brain really was quite stupid. It was kind of this Stone Age ogre that just wants to eat all the time. It's like, okay, you know, fool that idiot. But if it turns out the brain is quite smart, then this is a tactic that's going to have consequences. So this, um, what I became interested in, is what happens when you fool the brain in this way. And there's a very rich body of evidence, both in psychology and also in economics, which looks at happen what happens when you create a uncertainty in the brain or what psychologists call reward prediction error, which is to say the brain thinks it's getting something and it didn't get what it wanted. And this causes an elevation in dopamine wanting in that, in that system I talked about where we are motivated to eat. And very interestingly, this is what we see in a lot of the, the neuroscience of people with obesity or binge eating disorder. It's not that they enjoy food more. This idea that they lose themselves in the pleasures of food is wrong. Um, when they, for example, in a milkshake experiment, um, somebody with a trim uh, body will see the milkshake. You'll see the you know, spike in dopamine. Hey, that looks good. I might like to have a sip. And then they taste it and it tastes good. What we see with people with obesity or binge eating disorder is they see the milkshake and there's a huge spike of dopamine. They really want that. But then their experience of the pleasure is if anything blunted. So they're in a very different, uh, awful experience of food if you ask me, where they're, they're um, gripped by a craving for food that is never really matched by the, the experienced pleasure of it. So this to me is really important because we've been scrambling around trying to figure out what is it that changed. We know something changed in our environment that I don't think this is a natural state that we come out of the womb wired to stuff our faces. Um, and this is, a ch this is what technology, what food processing technology has done is change the sensed experience of food. Some of those are intentional technologies like fat replacers, synthetic flavors, you know, artificial flavors, natural flavors, another multi-billion dollar industry, artificial sweeteners. But there's also things we do just for processing purposes, emulsifiers, um, thickeners. These things, you know, we, we put these things in food because no one's going to buy a bottle of salad dressing or pasta sauce where there's like a, a layer of fat on the top. It looks disgusting. Um, we put things in a pizza so that when you microwave it, you don't get puddles forming. These things all have uses in, in, in food processing, but they also alter the sensory experience of that food. And this confuses the brain. And when the brain is in that state of uncertainty, it responds by wanting more. Now people say, well, why would that be? But it's, it's actually simple if you think about it. If you think about your car and you think of the fuel gauge, if that fuel gauge were uncertain, if it said full, half, whatever, but really you had no idea how much gas was in the tank, you'd, you'd fill it up more because you just don't wanna get caught running out of gas on the highway. You gotta call a tow truck, you're gonna miss your meeting. You'd probably become obsessed. Um, so, so that's why I think nutritive mismatch is so important because it really identifies something that truly has changed in food. It's something we see in processed food, which we know is a problem. And it's something we understand about how important it is for the brain to measuring information about food, both you know, superficially as it's coming in and then once it's inside the body. And nutritive mismatch, it, so it's not just about sweetness and calories, it's also about uh, micronutrients, if, if I understood correctly. Yes, so yes, I, I believe it is as well. I talked a lot about this in my previous book, The Dorito Effect, um, that uh, the flavors of food are um, kind of the brain's way of understanding where micronutrients are. And, and this actually started with my steak book, because um, you, know, you ask a simple question, how do cows obtain the nutrients that they need. They, they don't read men's health. Um, they don't go to school and do a, a course on nutrition. And yet somehow they sustain themselves and you can put them in stressful situations where they may be, you know, what, what we notice, for example, is an early sign of a mineral deficiency in cattle is you'll see them chewing on old bones. You'll see um, cattle eating rabbits. Uh, they, their deer will eat the eggs of puffins. They spit out the chicks but they chew up the shells because they have a mineral deficiency. So this idea that our inclinations are in line with our nutritional needs, I believe is true. And we see evidence of this in humans. If you look at scurvy, 
you know, hundreds of years ago when, when British sailors were racked with scurvy, the, the medical bigwigs of the day had no clue what caused it. They thought it was caused by, you know, a miasma, an ill wind. They thought the action of the sea could cause it or just not being on land. And yet the, you know, like a ship's chaplain would keep a diary and would say that when one of these ships would finally make land, what do the sailors do? They scramble onto land and they just start eating any kind of vegetable substance they can find. Wild turnips, they'll eat moss. One of the first symptoms of scurvy was a desire for fruits and vegetables. So this is a, a, an example that our inclinations are very much in line with our actual needs. It's a system that worked very well in a food environment where the sensed value in food matched the actual nutrition, but that's no longer the kind of environment we live in. Yeah, and, and I remember you talking about this. Uh, I think it must have been in the Rob Wolf interviews from, from years back when you were talking about how the goats uh, left to eat ad libitum in the field were able to select certain plants over others. And you could predict that according to some nutrient deficiencies that were uh, uh, induced into them, if, if I got yes. that right. Yes, exactly. So there's a great uh, experiment Fred Provenza did with sheep where he made them deficient in phosphorus. And um, he would then um, match a flavor. He'd give them a, a, basically an, an empty feed, not much nutrition. I think it was grape pomace. Um, that had a coconut flavor, but then he would give them a ruminal injection of phosphorus, so a tube down their throat. So then he matched the experience of coconut with the, the, you know, the nutritional acquisition of the needed nutrient, and these sheep come to form a, a, not just a liking for coconut, but they start to eat coconut as their phosphorus need is manipulated by Fred Provenza. Now you could say, well, maybe, maybe you know, they just like coconut. Coconut's tasty. Well, he also did it with another group with maple. Um, and then coconut was paired with water. And when you match the flavor with the needed nutrient, this, this preference forms. Uh, it, it, elegant and amazing experiment. Yeah, I, I loved hearing about them. And it really, it was really one of the things that spurred my interest in, in nutrient density, actually. Um, uh, in the last uh, three years, I had opened a, a startup that uh, it was a food tracking app basically. And one of the things we included uh, in it was a nutrient density and nutrient complete completeness score because we were pretty disillusioned with the average take on nutrient density that you might get in MyFitnessPal or something else where there's no nothing about bioavailability, nothing about completeness. It's really very uh, sort of unidimensional. Um, uh, it, it really doesn't uh, reflect the quality of the food well. So we try to invent a score based on that. And one of, one of the motivations I had in mind was that if we could show people the more nutrient-dense food, um, we would sort of happen to give them the right advice, even with regards to obesity, which is actually the primary reason people use food tracking apps in the first place, because this tended to score um, animal foods and uh, fibrous vegetables highest. Those tended to have the higher scores, which kind of makes sense if you understand us to be a species that consumed a lot of animal products and vegetables, essentially. That's kind of, if you want to summarize it, that's one way sure. you could summarize it. So for me, it was a nice way of bringing the uh, nutrient density aspect into the obesity uh, equation and, and saying that if you got one right, you'd probably get the other one. At least you'd improve the other one. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And and are you still in contact with uh, Fred Provenza? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Fred and I talk regularly. He's become a great friend and we, you know, we spend hours on the phone talking about stuff. He's uh, he's he's just a very, very interesting person. Very interesting perspective on on this really important area. And I wish there was more kind of crosstalk between the worlds of, of you know, human neuroscience and nutrition and what he does, which is behavioral ecology, which is looking at animals you know, I once sp spoke to a very, very prestigious scientist in the world of um, kind of the neuroscience of intake. And he said to me, you know, the problem with Fred Provenza is that he studies real animals and real environments. And I thought, how could that be a problem? <laughs> but it, 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 it gives you a window into how different realms of science think about things. That's, that's interesting. Usually ecological validity is a plus. If you're trying to get funding for something, you tend to argue that it's very reflective of the real world. So it's, uh, yeah. Well, and the thing is too, that we are complex organisms that live in a complex environment. So, so I understand why we reduce things in, in the lab and isolate variables, but we have to remember that that's, that's the lab, that's not the world. And it's the world ultimately that we're interested in. Yeah.
Um, so how do how has has this most recent book, if if it, if it has, how, how has it changed your view of food or even your personal habits around food? Is there some new insight that really changed something in, in how you approach it? Well, yes, in a number of ways. Um, wow, let me count the ways. Well, one of them is just with fat replacers. I, I, I'm not someone who's freakishly frightened of food, and and um, but I do read labels. And one thing that I find really interesting about the fat replacer industry is how different it is from the um, artificial sweetener industry. We're aware of artificial, artificial sweeteners. They have brand names that we recognize like Equal and NutraSweet. Um, it's often prominent on the package, you know, no sugar and so forth. Fat replacers are in a lot of foods that won't say anything about low fat or anything. Um, and they're very wily about how they appear on the ingredient label. They, they, you look at the industry brochures and they'll talk, they'll boast about having a clean label. So one of the first is a, a product called Simples. This is what the companies that make Simples, they call it Simples and they sell it to food manufacturers. But you will never see the word Simples on a label. What it actually is, it was discovered in Canada where I live when um, a scientist who worked for a brewing company tried to turn whey, which is you know what's left over when you make cheese, there's the curd, there's the whey, tried to turn it into a, a gel and got this weird gelatinous substance that crumbled like styrofoam, but it had this fatty taste like, like cottage cheese or like cheesecake. And it became um, an additive called Simples. And what it really is, is a microparticulated protein, just tiny, tiny little balls of protein that stimulate the trigeminal nerve and make your mouth think like, wow, I'm eating something fatty, rich, and delicious, fewer calories. Um, you don't see Simples in the ingredient label. You don't see microparticulated protein. You'll see something like milk protein or whey protein, which sounds it just sounds like it came from the farm. Um, there's one called Cream Fiber 7000. Um, this is a fat replacer designed for muffins, and it appears on the ingredient label as citrus fiber, which, I mean, to me, that sounds healthy. I think roughage, I think it's good for my colon, you know, I'm not going to get cancer, all, all those connotations right, right. we have, but that really isn't what it is. And, you know, the sign, I, I think there's kind of a duplicity when this is being done but we have to remember that we are motivating food companies to do this because we have become so paranoid about calories. And now we have nutritional, you know, the, the nutritional info panel. Everybody looks at the calorie number as though we have any ability to actually track the number of calories we consume, as though we have any clue about what we're expending. But we look at this number and think, oh, I'll buy this one and not this one. Every time we do that, we motivate the companies to find some way of reducing the calories. So more than ever, companies are putting artificial sweeteners, sugar, alcohols, fat replacers and foods to bring that caloric number down. And we're just continually confusing the brain, giving information that's false about what these foods actually contain. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah, the food labels are a mess. I know that the FDA allows for a 20% plus or minus variation in the actual calorie count. So that alone makes it entirely unreliable, even if you were somehow able to count them. So yes, those food labels have to go through big law changes, I think, if, if they're going to be useful. I, I, I agree. And I also think, you know, I wouldn't say get rid of them, but this idea that we can, you know, we have this nutritional info panel and no one, very few people really understand much about carbohydrates or protein or calories. And, and you asked how it's changed my thinking. Uh, one thing I found very interesting studying this book was, was set point theory. And, and I truly thought like so many people, that what we eat is kind of under executive function that we can, people say people navigate the food environment as though we go around like nutritionists with white lab coats saying, you know, protein here, carbohydrates, calories, vitamins. This isn't anything like it works. And of course, this is not how we evolve to eat. That, that's not how the sensory system works or the pleasure system. Um, and what was really enlightening to me was the, was the very old literature on set point theory, which is to say that the brain essentially defends a certain set point. Um, and it's not under cognitive control. And this is why diets fail. Um, they work for about six months, and then the brain intervenes and people experience lethargy and they experienced an enhanced appetite. So, so we really, and the whole diet industry really operates under this myth that, you know, you can go out and change it yourself. Some people can, some people are very disciplined. They probably, um, maybe they're not as inclined to overconsume calories in the first place. Um, but so many people fight this battle with their brain that they don't realize that they're fighting. So I think the real key to, to if we're going to understand this is understanding kind of like the appetite's mind that the brain thinks about food very differently than the kind of conscious 
you know, you. Uh, it, it has its own instruction manual, a very good one because we're a successful species. We evolved uh, and it, we could feed ourselves up until relatively recently. Yeah, it's amazing how we've, we've managed to take so much control over our food supply by bec becoming, um, you know, an agricultural society that can stockpile and essentially pr predict the, the future in a sense, because we can increase the odds of, of a guaranteed outcome of having enough food. Um, but that with it has brought a ton of problems, essentially diseases of civilization and destruction um, of the uh, soil biome and the soil yes. itself through monocrop agriculture. And with the same reductionistic approach, which sort of we could say contextually made sense in terms of what we we're trying to do, becoming a more civilized society means you need time not hunting and gathering and, and, and stay in the same place for long periods of time. But now we're trying to solve these problems we've created with the same tools. And I think once again, we're, we're lacking this evolutionary lens, whether it's about the food or whether we talk about the soils or even how we frame the problems of obesity. Um, and there's a, a quote of yours that I, I really uh, liked. I think you said, sweetness was like the trumpeter at the castle gates. It heralded not only the arrival of calories, but the specific quantity and began making arrangements for how they would be useful when you were talking about the experiments with the, with the rats and changing the sweetness and the calories. And yes. that is in a sense, uh, what I call metabolic partitioning. So when I talk about obesity, I don't talk about a psychological disorder. It's fundamentally how those ca calories are partitioned into the metabolism. And, and I think that you have correctly identified some variables like sweetness and, and caloric value as helping partition that properly. And to me, it's much more helpful and actually encouraging message for people who are struggling with obesity, because trying to convince yourself there's nothing fundamentally wrong with you when you can witness behavior about yourself that you dislike is, is very uh, discouraging. And I think if we can bring back the fundamental cause of the problem uh, with elements that we can't really control consciously, we can only make better food choices with, with the knowledge we're given. I think that would be much more encouraging to people more, more generally. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's also helpful to understand the, you know, eating, digestion, metabolism as a, as a signaling system where there's information being, uh, you know, analyzed by the brain at every level. So that, um, you know, there's that line, there's that guy, Jack LaLanne, he was this sort of fitness guru. And he said, if it tastes good, spit it out. And this just so beautifully encapsulates this North American suspicion of experience. This get back to, gets back to behaviorism. And it's wrong. Um, there's a, a story I tell in the book. Um, it's it's, a, it's I think over 100 years old. It's a very sad story of a little boy. Um, he somehow consumed clam chowder that was so hot, it sealed his esophagus shut. So he couldn't, he, he couldn't feed himself through his mouth. So doctors created a fistula in his stomach where he could just put the food in, but it wasn't working. He, they, they created this, they were, they were getting food into his body, but he was not thriving. And this little boy, I think he was nine years old, just, he said, let me taste it first. So they'd let him taste the food and then they put it in his stomach. And then for the rest of his life, he would chew his food and he would spit it into um, a little tube that was connected to his stomach. And he said, if he didn't do that, he, he, it, it's like the food went right through him. He didn't feel as though he ate. And I think this wow. is such good evidence that, you know, like we think of nutrition as, we think of like food and eating as being somehow irrelevant and confused. And what's really important are vitamins, minerals, protein, carbs, and fat getting into the body. But that gets it so wrong. That is eventually what happens. But the way it gets into the body is through the experience of eating food. And that's what we evolved to be. And this whole idea that that's just somehow we can just avoid that, that that's just kind of dumb and from the Stone Age is just 100% wrong. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think like, like when we talk about macronutrients, actually, I think there's a, a, a level of complexity we have to add to that, uh, that can tie many things together. For example, carbs have, have been uh, you know, very controversial because there's a lot of experiments, a lot of good quality evidence showing them to be obesogenic, yet you can find counterexamples and you can find ethnographic data sort of contradicting that. So the question is, how do you reconcile these observations? And I think for the, for the most part, you actually can when you think about the food structure. So um, if you look at flour and uh, isolated sugars, especially in liquids, 
they both uh, affect the upper digestive tract in negative ways, meaning they stimulate the incretin, the L and K cells, uh, which produce uh, you know, a signal insulin, GLP-1, GIP, these uh, satiety and hunger hormones, uh, and they stimulate them uh, incorrectly. So you will produce more insulin for a given amount of carbohydrate if it's from a sugary drink or from flour than if it's from a whole fruit or a potato, for example. So we have this really interesting system and we can see it even in people who have bariatric surgery. They have improvements in their, um, in their diabetes because they tend to have diabetes that, are, that happen way too fast to be accounted for by calories alone. The physiology of the gut is changed. And, and that's where I think we can get beyond the simple macronutrient wars and, and start to give some higher resolution answers like the quality of the carbohydrates, the order of the food in which it's eaten having, for example, yeah. fat and fiber before the sugar will improve the metabolic response to that food. And uh, of course, this is mirrored in the uh, cultural traditions. We tend to have the sweets yes. at the end of the, of the meal. Yeah. So it's interesting because I, I came from it from the school of like Gary Taubes and the carbs. And I, I admire Gary to, to no end. I think he's done such a service to the, to the conversation around food. But ultimately, I think I think it's, it's a little more complex than a macronutrient. I think it's the structure of food, the speed at which sugars are absorbed, the amount of certain fats like linoleic acid, the nutritive mismatch, like you were mentioning. I think all these things come into play. Um, uh, it, yeah, no, it, and it's interesting when you think of the nutritive mismatch, the, the kind of the throwing up of its hands could be in a sense the, 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 the stomach confused or the brain confused at the rate at which these nutrients need to be processed. Um, right. And if you talk about sugar and flour, these are both carbohydrates used in the context of processing, which is to say they're very often going to be paired with additives that are going to fool the brain, such that maybe sugar wouldn't be such of a problem if the mm -hmm. sensed value of it always matched what was, what was being received. Fruit, I mean, if you bite into a peach, a peach, it, it always tastes like a peach. And it's not, right. it, it's, it, it, there's really very little room for mismatch. Um, in real foods. It's in processed foods where you get the, these signals going in all sorts of different directions. Yeah, and and another thing to think yeah. about, you know, we talk about carbohydrates, that's sort of a, a kind of a molecular in a sense, but there's, there's carbohydrates we consume now that didn't exist in our evolutionary past. I, I mentioned um, maltodextrin. Maltodextrin can have varying levels of sweetness depending on the form of maltodextrin you get. That's interesting in itself. It can also be used as a fat replacer. So you've got something that evokes this sensation of fat, but it's actually a carbohydrate. Um, we have uh, modified starches. So if you think of the starch that was in something like corn historically, well, that was always paired with the experience of corn. It tastes like corn. Well, that's your brain getting some information about what's in there. Now we've created what I call stealth carbs, which are, they get into your stomach without ever evoking any kind of sensory response. They, they do, you know, nice things like uh, uh, maybe make a, a sauce nice, thick and rich and so forth, um, or stop, uh, they, they have an emulsifying effect, but we don't, we don't sense them. And if sensing is important for how food is metabolized, this is going to be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to know where to, where to start. There are so many things about food that has changed. If you were trying to implement a policy, you'd be you know, embarrassed by how many things you, you should be changing and can only attend to. I don't, I don't know, would you have a priority? How, how would you see this at a, at a big picture level? That's a great question. Um, I mean, at the big picture level, I always say eat real food. And that's not exactly new. Everybody who looks at, you know, a lot of people look at this and say, hey, you know, we should just eat real food. But I also say, eat like the Italians, which is to say, eat the most pleasurable food. That, that eating is not right. some kind of act of denial and repression of pleasure, it should be an absolute indulging moment. It's what's, you know, we get to do it three times a day. And uh, when you visit these food environments where people have a healthy relationship, I mean, what could be better? You get to enjoy the food that you eat. Um, but when you say, what would I regulate? One thing that I think you'll find interesting is, um, is fortification, is the addition of vitamins specifically to process carbohydrates. Um, because this is something that gets no attention um, it's been law in North America for almost a century. Um, and I think it has unintended consequences, uh, in part because we tend to see calories as being evil and vitamins as being good, when the truth is that they're 
you know, nothing is like that in, in the world of nutrition. Things can be both good and bad, depending on context, dose, and all the rest of it. Um, but that's what I see. Um, it, you know, it really is a cultural difference. And I talk in the book about pellagra, which was um, a niacin deficiency that affected both Northern Italy and the Southern US. And it, it's important for a bunch of reasons, but the most interesting thing is how the two cultures responded. Um, America responded by saying, let's add B vitamins to flour because these poor Southerners were eating grits, which is kind of like polenta. They were eating pork fat and molasses. Um, so, and there was no niacin. So they were, although they had this very calorie rich diet, they were essentially starving. So the government said, okay, uh, that good stuff isn't in food. So let's make food better. And it became essentially law to add niacin, riboflavin, thymine, and also iron. It, first it was bread, but then it's it sort of, it's made its way into all the processed carbs and it worked beautifully. Like pellagra was just wiped out overnight. And it seemed like such a wonderful, you know, marriage of the cutting edge science of nutrition with public policy. Italians didn't do that. And, and what the Italians did is it's almost like hilarious because it sounds medieval. They said, poor people should grow rabbits because rabbits um, are a good source of cheap meat. They said they should have communal bread ovens. They even said, people would say in Italy, people with pellagra should drink wine, which is like, are you nuts? These people have a nutritional deficiency and you're saying like vino. And yet there was perhaps unintentionally or through some kind of folk wisdom, a knowledge there because the, uh, the wines back then were unfiltered. They had a lot of yeast in them and yeast is absolutely loaded with niacin. So if you're suffering from pellagra in Northern Italy because you eat way too much polenta, drinking some of the wine back then was actually a very smart thing to do. Um, Italy also wiped out pellagra. It happened more slowly, but they literally ate their way out of a nutritional deficiency. You fast forward the clock 100 years, and these two places could not be more different. The southern U.S. went from being the pellagra belt to becoming the diabetes belt, the obesity belt. We see the highest rates of obesity and metabolic dysfunction right where we had pellagra a century ago. Northern Italy, like I mentioned, eats this delicious, wonderful, rich diet. They have an obesity rate of less than 8%. So radically different outcome. And then, so I asked the question, did this policy of enrichment, also called fortification, have something to do with it? Um, on the one hand, it seems nuts. Like there's been so many crazy theories about obesity that to say it's vitamins is like, you know, what are you going to say? It's like air or something like what, you know? But I looked into it, and, and what is so interesting is if you look at the history of livestock diets, and specifically I looked at um, pigs, because pigs, of all the animals we raise to eat, pigs are the most like us. They're monogastric, they're omnivores. Um, and if you look at pig farming in the 1950s, um, you know, in a commodity system where you're paid by, you know, by the pound, um, the goal is to get pigs big and fat quickly, because that's how you make the money. And farmers back then knew that if, if there was kind of a rocket fuel feed for pigs, it was corn and soy. But they also knew that that's, if you just fed them that, they would get basically like a pig version of pellagra. It was not nutritionally complete. So they sent them out to pasture. They would eat alfalfa was one of the big pasture forages they ate. And that's how they balanced the diet. They would talk back then about balancing the diet, even though they didn't really have a perfect knowledge of what that meant. Well, the, in, the discovery of vitamins changed farming forever. We talk about confinement farming, about industrialized farming, without realizing that, that um, gains in knowledge of micronutrition made that possible. Um, it meant that you no longer needed to send your pigs out to pasture to get their, uh, their uh, micronutrients. Now you could, you could put it all into this rocket fuel feed. And it's very interesting because you look at the early trials and they would give one, pig, you know, one group just corn and soy and they, you know, they just, it was ugly. They, they, they consumed a lot of food, very little of it. It all went through them. And they just start to add one B vitamin at a time. And you just start to see the curve of weight gain go up. The, the, the amount of time it took them to get fat reduces, the feed efficiency improves. Um, and there's old, you know, literature I found put out by the agricultural colleges saying, um, you know, the pig has a reasonable ability to balance its diet, but we don't need that anymore because now you can add the vitamins and you get what they call optimal weight gain. If you want optimal weight gain in pigs, you feed them processed carbs with B vitamins. Well, what did we do to humans? We, we don't wanna be like pigs. We don't wanna get big and fat quickly, but what did we do? We added B vitamins to our processed carbs. And it, and it, didn't, it just started in the 1940s. We cranked that up again um, in the 1960s. We see obesity increasing in the 70s, but we also have in North America, in the United States, um, voluntary fortification. 
So companies, you know, there's vitamin water. They, they put these grandiose loads of B vitamins to breakfast cereals. They're all over the place. And people look at this nutritional info panel and they think, oh, great, it's got vitamins. Vitamins are healthy. Uh, without realizing that the B vitamins in particular, they are involved in energy metabolism. So let's just go back and look at those poor Southerners. Like I said, they're eating grits, pork fat and molasses, carbs, fat and sugar, and they were starving. Can you think of a more calorically rich diet? The B vitamins are necessary for, for energy metabolism. Niacin is really interesting because it's necessary for fructose metabolism. And fructose has this, uh, this kind of a reputation. A lot of people think it's a problem. We don't always understand why there's a lot of controversy. There's some very old science, which is in the textbooks, but no one seems to be aware of, that to metabolize fructose, you need a lot of niacin, uh, much more than any of the other carbohydrates need. Well, you know, we consume too much fructose. We, we consume too much high fructose corn syrup. We consume too much fructose, half of which is fruct sucrose, half of which is, is fructose. Well, if we're gonna consume all that fructose, we need a high level of niacin. Well, what are, we're dumping niacin into everything. So if sugar really is a problem, and I think it does play a role, we have to look at, on a deeper level, how is that sugar being metabolized? And then I ask a question, I look at Italy, and I think they have sweets. I mean, think of the wonderful sweets they have in Northern Italy, um, uh, gelato, zabayon, uh, wonderful desserts, and yet they don't overconsume them. And I have to wonder, on some level, is there an understanding in their brain that they they simply can't. They don't have enough niacin to, to just consume all that sugar. So th these are questions that we don't ask that I think are very important. And it's just not as simple as over-consuming because to, to over-consume something, you need all sorts of conditions for that to be possible. Yeah. And, and who purposely over-consumes? Virtually no one. I mean... No, exactly. Virtually no one. Yeah. Un so, yeah. Unless you're like in a hot dog eating right. contest, right? Right. I mean, you would you would have to assume that virtually everyone, which you could verify for yourself, you don't need to be a scientist, you could just talk to people, would be lying about their motivation around food. Rather, it's much easier to understand that they have this drive that we were talking about initially, uh, that's that can be dissociated from the liking and influenced by your metabolism, which goes back to the B vitamins, which play a, a role in metabolizing foods and niacin uh, as a precursor. Uh, to uh, the nucleotides that are really form the basic part of metabolism that are shuttling electrons around and, and stuff like yes. that. So uh, it's really interesting. Actually, the, the evidence you presented in that chapter was the best evidence I've seen uh, for, for arguing that obesity could have to do with an excess of specifically B vitamins combined with these refined carbohydrates. And I think it, it could be an elegant uh, add on to explain because there's so much obesity to explain that it's, yes. it's not enough to find something that can explain it. It has to explain the effect size we're seeing at the societal level. And I think that's actually a really interesting piece of evidence there. Well, here's another, I didn't put this in the book because it was a little inside baseball, but if you look at the chows that we feed to rodents, they're absolutely packed with B vitamins and nobody knows why. So um, uh, for some reason, the Purina 5001 chow is one of the most popular it's got almost an order of magnitude more niacin than is necessary in a rodent diet. And wow. I talked to all sorts of scientists say, why do you use the 5001 tablet, uh, chow pellet? They just sort of say, that's the one everyone uses. You, you look on uh, all sorts of companies make these things and they say, you know, call our hotline to speak to a nutritionist. So I call the hotline. I say, why is there so much niacin in here? Chow pellet. And they say, well, cause it's the industry leader. And you're like, okay, why? <laughs> and they, they don't have an answer. I, I, it's been like this for decades. I don't know if anyone knows why. But it's interesting when you look at the um, when you look at the cafeteria studies. I actually spoke to a, 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 a scientist who did a, one of these kind of um, food addiction studies in rats, and I said, "What was the most surprising thing about it to you?" And he said, "Well, when we gave them access to all these sort of junk foods, the cake icing and you know all that crap that they gave them, he said I was really surprised at how much chow they kept on eating." But it's interesting because if you if you think that essentially they were consuming empty calories, where were they getting the micronutrients to support that? from the chow they would have gotten pellagra if or or you know right. one of the other ones had they just been eating the junk food so it's it's also important because we talk about empty calories and that empty calories are the problem but that can't be true because if all we ate were empty calories we would have a nutritional deficiency so i think looking at the micronutrients of obesity is important it's not all micronutrients and and we do see that people with obesity um, I think it's vitamin E and vitamin A that you often see there's less of, 
But if, if you want to achieve obesity, and we know this from livestock, you need a certain micronutrient blend to make that happen. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I think that really needs to be better under, understood because there's so much fortification go, uh, going yes. around, like you said. It's it's ubiquitous and it's considered such an advance that it's it's nearly sacred from a food I, industry. Absolutely. And when you argue against it, you, you, it's like you're some kind of a like a terrorist or something. Like who could possibly <laughs> say something bad about vitamins? I, I actually spoke to someone once high up at the. There's a kind of this food fortification initiative. And they were talking about speaking because they don't fortify in France or Italy. Um, and um, they said almost kind of mockingly how the French regard their flour as sacred. And I think, mm. well, maybe they know something that you don't. <laughs> but yeah. these these kind of traditions, these folk traditions, there's there's some wisdom embedded within them. Yeah. And I think this this drives a certain class of scientists crazy to to have to admit that there's some folk wisdom that maybe justifies it for all the wrong reasons but just happens to empirically work and yeah. i think this is very difficult for a certain science for, for scientists from a certain cultural background to to accept that um if you, if you don't have an explanation it's very uncomfortable to say i don't know <laughs> no but it's it's it, you know i'm very interested in preference and so forth and you know we're talking about how people can be motivated to eat without enjoying it there's so many foods that i think of as a food lover mushrooms i love mushrooms it's interesting to think that mushrooms were a source of vitamin D uh, because wild dried mushrooms will have vitamin D, but they certainly aren't a great source of calories. Um, right. If you think of fruit, I, I absolutely love fruit. You know, a ripe peach at the peak of summer, there's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. It's not a great source of calories. I mean, I, I can go buy a right. Twinkie. It's gonna have way more calories, but it's what a wonderful food experience that is. So I think, I think that's also a problem is understanding the hedonics of food because motivation is different from enjoyment. And there's this kind of circular logic that palatability equals calories and calories equals palatability. And that sometimes appears to be true, but I think very often it's not true. And I think yeah. when we think about, well, let's think about junk food. I mean, this is the interesting thing to me. I will eat potato chips at a party. Like my hand goes to the bowl and I think like, what the hell am I doing? Um, not that I'm concerned that much about it, but like you'll sometimes stop and wash the zest off your hands and then you go back and eat it again. But I never mm -hmm. say to someone like, wow, that that I had the, this bag of potato chips in 2003 <laughs> that just blew my mind. It's, it's never like that. It's just you consume it in this kind of reinforcing way. But it's it's these are never the foods that we tell stories about or say like, wow, I can't wait to travel back to that part of Italy so I can eat this or, or that. Absolutely. I was when I was younger, I was uh, infamous for the amount of bread that I would eat. I would just eat it compulsively. I would be watching TV and I'd get up five times during the TV show to go get some bread. And there was certainly no genuine hunger cue. There were certainly, it wasn't, I don't even remember it as being particularly uh, tasty. I just remember the compulsion of having to do that. And, and now many, many years later, I, I actually have a ulcerative colitis, which means it's, it's hard for me to handle fibrous vegetables and uh, a lot of carby stuff. So I eat pr pretty much a, a carnivore diet for the most part, except for some like dairy and honey and a little mm -hmm. bit of fruit here and there. But uh, my pleasure of food has only increased and not diminished. Um, the fruit is much sweeter to me now than it was before. Um, I'm much more able to appreciate the nuance of a dark chocolate than I could before when I was eating a lot more sugar. Um, mm -hmm. I'm more sensitive to alcohol, even, even the sub subjective effects. Um, so it's really interesting to witness your palate change, but actually become more sensitive, meaning that I'll, I'll bake something like a keto cheesecake every once in a while. Um, but it's hard for me to, I can't overindulge in it. It's delicious. It's creamy. I mean, the textures are all there. You know, it's, it's this lightly burnt almond, which is, you know, really nice. But I, I can't, I, I don't have an addictive behavior around it anymore. The food is the same. The food environment is the same. But I've certainly changed. It's very noticeable through my habits. And I, I just wish more people could realize how much they can, fix a lot of those behavioral issues. No, I, I agree. And, and I think it's important because there's so much of a drive right now to kind of legislate our way out of this, that we'll have a fat tax or a sugar tax. And we think we can, right. we, we forget that politicians write legislation, not scientists. Um, but, but the other thing is, I, I think for these changes to work, they have to be changes within us. Um, you know, I had this kind of epiphany. I was in Northern Italy. I went to a bean festival, you know, one of the, you know, one of these towns that they, we have the best beans that some Pope sent them there in 1532 and that kind of a thing. And they really are wonderful beans. But I asked a guy selling beans, you know, how do I cook them? And 
he was an absolute purist. And he said, you boil them and then he, he would dress them in a neutral vegetable oil. He did not want olive oil corrupting the flavor. Then someone else steps in and said, well, you should add an onion. And someone says, you know, you want to put some rosemary. And someone says, no, you don't want rosemary, you want oregano. But yet again, everywhere I go, people are arguing about food. It's all we do. But here's the difference. In Italy, the arguments are about recipes, about what is the best way to extract the most pleasure from this. And in North America, it's, it's, about, um, it's about nutrients. Um, and uh, you know, eating is about nutrients, but it's the experience of food is how we get those nutrients. Yeah, I mean, I just I just spend so much more time at the dinner table than the average person uh, <laughs> just shopping, uh, uh, literally uh, uh, building a relationship with a butcher. Like when I yes. move to a new city, I will I'll tend to look for a butcher, which I can have a nice chat with. And all of this comes into it, but it's very hard to explain because there's no simple algorithm. It's basically sensitizing yourself to the taste that exists and making the choices where you don't have to use any executive function. In fact, uh, you, should, you should be undisciplined in a sense, and it should work out for you if you're doing the right choices. But I don't know how much that applies to people with severe obesity. I don't know if they can get back to a state of um, uh, discerning tastes and calories the same way maybe I could, who never suffered from obesity. Well, I, I, I went to a clinic in Germany um, where I met a scientist doing really interesting work and I met one of her patients. I'll, I'll tell you, but I underwent some of the therapy, but I talked to one of her patients who underwent this therapy. This patient had binge eating disorder. And um, through this, he, what's called hedonic therapy, she was able to kind of revalue foods, revalue foods in an intuitive way, not kind of, you know, mathematically. Right. Um, and she talked about the fact that she, you know, she always used to love to eat cake, but she said she now understood that cake kind of, you know, whispers promises that it never delivers on, that, that you really want to eat the cake, but, but it, it didn't, she realized that it didn't really satisfy her. She really started to enjoy the flavor of plain yogurt with fruit because the, mm. the sourness and the tang of the, of the yogurt would then be quenched by the burst of sweetness when she crunched the fruit. So um, she loved dark chocolate. And she said, the thing about dark chocolate is you, you just can't eat it quickly. You have right. to eat it slowly and pensively. There, there's so much to this. You know, um, if you look at Italians and French, they consume fewer calories, significantly fewer calories than Americans. And yet it takes them more than twice as long to consume those calories, which it's like, are you, like, are you chewing slowly? But it just tells you so much about um, that it's not just about caloric consumption. It's, it's the way we eat. So when I went to this lab, I, I took part in this hedonic therapy and it started with potato chips. Um, and uh, she, she gave me two potato chips. She said, you, you can't eat them. Um, you can sniff them. She said, you can nibble them a little bit. She said, you can even rub them together. And I thought that's weird, but I did it. And it was really amazing how I was absolutely gripped by, by wanting, by craving. I wanted these chips so badly that it was starting to hurt. She said, throw them in the garbage. That was painful to do. Like what I gave it. And then I got two fresh ones and these fresher chips were somehow even more enticing. And this wave of just astonishing craving seized hold of me. And, and it, I was able to reflect on it and realize that even someone like me who doesn't really have a particularly problematic relationship with food, I can still experience that, that kind of more primitive dopamine urge to consume. Then she gave me a square of dark chocolate surrounding a biscuit center. And she said, now just pop this in your mouth and close your eyes and let the heat of your body melt this. And I did. And this talk, chocolate just took me on a journey. I was the passenger. It was, it was kind of the the shaman. And it was amazing how much pleasure the small piece of chocolate delivered. What is so interesting is that um, Anya Hilbert is the scientist's name. She has patients with binge eating disorder. When they are overcome with these just volcanic bursts of craving to eat, she'll say, eat like a Belgian praline, a very, very fine chocolate. And it can deliver so much pleasure that it, it can distinguish this bonfire of wanting. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, scientists will talk about hedonic eating uh, if that's such a thing, then maybe there's such a thing as hedonic therapy, that, that there's a way to use the science of what we enjoy um, and get beyond just the simple arithmetic of, of calories and protein to, to, to get a better handle on this. Yeah, that is interesting because the classical approach will be to find ways to ignore this call that, that you have for pleasure and her approach is, no, no, maximize it, do, uh, experience it the most efficiently as possible, essentially. It's yes, and, and so people ask me, do you count calories? I'm like, well, not really, but if I do, it, it's in a way where I try to maximize the pleasure for calories consumed. 
I right. think, you know, an example that pops in my head is if I'm trapped in an airport, the plane is delayed and you're starving, like you have to succumb and eat some fast food meal. The thing that always amazes me is how quickly I eat it and how unsatisfying it is. Like I could probably eat yeah. two of them, right? It's just like, um, but you're eating like, like 1100 calories. Well, then two nights later, I'm back at home with my wife. I'll cook uh, two ribeye steaks. I'll make, you know, potatoes fried in duck fat yeah. and, and we'll have a salad and more than one glass of red wine. Now, there's a lot of calories in that meal. Um, and yet it is a totally different experience and it is so satiating. And even the next day, you know, you wake up the next day, you're not really, you'll have a very light breakfast. You're still full from the night before. Um, and those kinds of things we're not good at tracking because, you know, we can just look at those two meals and say, well, one had 1100 calories and one had 1250, but they're very, very different meals. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, that's sort of the interesting stuff that emerged from Kevin Hall's studies where, in a perfectly controlled setting where calories are matched, you can learn some very interesting things about the mechanics, but you fail to notice those sort of like the, the behavioral ghosts that, that really drive us in the real world. And, and I think that's where hopefully we'll have some, some newer experiments to disentangle that further and, and really look at the ad libitum effects because those ultimately are the ones we're gonna have to count on to actually make progress because we cannot, uh, calculate our way out of obesity. I can't. agree, and nor can we repress our way out of it. No, exactly, exactly. I think it's a, a puritanism that we have to drop and 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 sort of em embrace whatever uh, whatever hypothesis we're going to find that it explains it best. But no, that's it's really interesting because I actually have a podcast with uh, Tucker Goodrich and Amber O'Hearn, uh, both friends of mine who who for different reasons, uh, for personal health reasons, one uh, because of uh, inflammatory bowel disorder. Uh, went to low carb, low linoleic acid diet, and Amber O'Hearn because of a bipolar disorder, and then uh, obesity uh, went on a low carb, ketogenic, and finally carnivore diet to to resolve much of her issues. And we will be debating this question of food reward and palatability, and 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 how that matches up. So it's it'll certainly it's certainly very timely that we had this discussion because I'll have Good. more to bring to it. That's great. Yeah. Um, so Mark, I want to ask you before before we go. Um, what I don't want to ask you what, what's next because you just published a book and I know you don't want to be asked about that. But if you if you reflect back on steak, the Dorito effect and craving, and you want to leave people with you know with a, maybe a heuristic because a law is maybe too too hard, but a heuristic to think about food, um, what would that be? What what would you tell them? Um, I would say that I think we've been taught to. Um believe there's something wrong with nature, that nature, that food is imperfect and needs to be adulterated and that our own inclinations are imperfect and need to be controlled. And I would say it's the opposite, that food is perfect. What we need is access to good food and that we should trust our inclinations and indulge in pleasure. And I think we should be very suspicious of all our efforts to create fakery in food, fake meat, fake dairy, fake flavors, fake sweeteners. Um, we think these strategies are smart because we think our brains are stupid our brains are incredibly intelligent eaters and we should eat what we evolved to eat, which is real food. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I think we have to clip that and, and put it uh, on repeat on, on Twitter because a lot of people need to hear that. They'll be Thanks. scared yeah. to indulge just in the right stuff. <laughs> that's right. And it's, uh, and I mean, there's nothing better. I love, I love food. I love traveling to eat and uh, our, our cultures learned long ago how to eat. And uh, that's just what we need to do. Yeah. So over the this year, I'm going to be uh, sometime in Lisbon and sometime in Nice in the south of France. So if you ever make it to any of those destinations, I've got a lot of good uh, cooking to, to introduce you to. I would love that. I can think of nothing better. Yeah. So I will definitely follow up on that. I'm going to now connive some ways to get <laughs> yeah. there. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, we'll, we'll be glad to have you. Home cooking and restaurant cooking. Uh, there's a lot to go from there. So thanks. Thanks for your time. I yeah, always thank you. I had a great time. Great discussion. I hope we do it again sometime. Yeah, definitely. So this will come out, uh, it should come out later today. And uh, yeah, that'll be interesting to a lot of people for sure. Yeah, and uh, in your community, you, um, you know, you don't have to put this, but it, I'll be interested, a lot of the people you're connected to, I hope, I, I just love some of these ideas to get some oxygen because, and even critical yeah. responses. It's just, we need new ideas. We need to think about these things differently. Yeah, no, but that's that's exactly what your, your book did. Because like I said, I, I tend to bring obesity down to the structure of these carbohydrates and linoleic acid, but I, I couldn't tell you with any certainty that those will explain everything. 
And yes. I think the, the, the extra bits that you brought to my attention really, really make me reflect. So I think that's, that's exactly what we need more of. That's great. Well, uh, we'll keep the dialogue going. Yeah, perfect.